Hi everyone, welcome to this timeline documentary. Just before you watch, I want to tell you about my new history channel. It's called History Hits. It's like the Netflix for history. It's got hundreds and hundreds of history documentaries on there and interviews with some of the world's best historians. We're adding new stuff all the time. For example, today I'm filming in this one of the few remaining Lancaster bombers for a show about the Dam Busters raid in 1943. If you want to know more about History Hit, follow the information uh, just below this video or search online for History Hit and make sure you use the code TIMELINE to get a special introductory offer. Now enjoy this show. Officially, we Britons have been Christian for more than 1,500 years. But scratch the surface and you'll find our ancestors believed in far more than Christ and the cross. Pagan gods, witches, demons, evil spirits were all proclaimed as terrifying fact. Now I want to uncover what beliefs and fears really built Britain. This week, along with a team of top historians, I'm investigating why our ancestors once lived in terror of witches. Why were hundreds of women believed to be committing horrific supernatural crimes? The grinding up of bones of babies of murdered children would make the broomstick fly. How could you tell who practiced the dark arts? In medieval times, people might have said, you've got the devil's mark. Why did a witch's power come from sex with Satan? His semen is icy cold. And how could you commit murder through magic? They were a very feared set of people. Today, witches are the stuff of fairy tales. Fantastical creatures that ride broomsticks and cast spells over bubbling cauldrons. But back in the 16th and 17th centuries, when the Tudors and Stuarts ruled, everyone thought they were terrifying fact. For 200 years, we were so scared of witches, the church and state became hell-bent on exterminating them. Across Europe, more than 40,000 innocent people were put to death. These horrific witch hunts were one of the darkest and bloodiest periods in our history. I want to find out exactly what the word witch meant to our ancestors. Where did they come from? What harm did they do? And how on earth could you stop them? To get the answers, I'm going to investigate a case study from the many thousands documented in contemporary court records. I've chosen Agnes Sampson, a Scottish midwife believed to be the inspiration for Shakespeare's witches in Macbeth. In 1590, Agnes was accused of trying to murder King James VI of Scotland with black magic. Her spells were thought to have conjured up a terrible storm that nearly sank his ship. No! No! I hope her story will reveal why our ancestors were so convinced witchcraft was real. Helping me in my quest is historian Dr Lawrence Normand. She was right at the centre of one of the most um, spectacular witch hunts in Scotland, the so-called Be North Berwick Witch Hunt in 1590. And she was supposed to have gathered with some other witches by 200 in North Berwick Kirk and plotted to kill King James and also his wife, Queen Anne. And that was the centre of a big kind of... Uh, plot against the, against the king. So did they think she had powers? Yes, I mean, it was they, those who were accusing her of witchcraft thought that she had made a pact with the devil. <laughs> and in doing that, she'd acquired demonic powers, devilish powers. When you say she was in league with the devil, what did that mean? Not only did the devil give them supernatural powers that they could do uh, all sorts of extraordinary things, but that they had um, the power to destroy. They could kill your children, they could uh, destroy your livestock, give you diseases. They were a very feared set of people. So our ancestors believed 
that witches weren't born with their terrible powers. They were ordinary women who had been tempted to the dark side by the devil himself. This meant your wife, daughter or sister could easily become one. Professor Malcolm Gaskell is going to reveal how this diabolic transformation was thought to take place. Well, the way in which accused witches sometimes do describe their first meetings with the devil is that they're going about their business and, yes, he suddenly appears, often in a, a kind of a rural setting like this. It was believed that the devil could travel in the form of smoke or mist and then morph into any disguise he wanted. Why would respectable, upright women like Agnes have fallen for the devil? The devil, you know, we, we think of as a very frightening being, and of course people were frightened of him. But then to those who possibly were powerless, like women, especially poor women, that he was also something rather attractive about him. And it wasn't just attractive that he, he was presenting with a kind of business proposition, he was actually often described as an attractive man who would come to you like a sexual suitor. What did he do once he'd got one of these women on side? What the devil would try and do is sweet talk the candidate that he's identified into coming over to his side. So he might point out the inadequacy of the candidate's life and say, you know, you're living a life of absolute poverty, you know, I could make you richer. You're living a life of powerlessness, I can give you power. Once he'd found a willing convert, then he would look to kind of seal the deal. And that meant fixing a, a, a covenant or a contract or a pact with the individual. Court records reveal that the most horrific aspect of the diabolic pact was thought to be when the devil mated with his new recruit. This whole 16th century fantasy revolved around women exchanging their virtue for power from hell. You've got to remember, of course, that this is all about inversion. So that the devil is like the, the opposite of a good husband. And this is the witch giving herself intimately to her new master. The witch has often described that the devil is cold, his body is cold, and even that his semen is icy cold. Of course, what it symbolises is the witch now, she's committed a crime against um, uh, the government, she's committed a crime against the church and religion. In this nightmare fantasy, sex with the devil would transform women like Agnes into terrifying witches. But they'd be impossible to spot, as outwardly they'd look absolutely normal. Professor Marion Gibson explains. The woman next door to you could be a witch. The woman in the same house as you could be a witch. And you wouldn't know she was exactly like other women. But on the inside, she might be very, very evil. What kind of evil things did they do that were actually quite ordinary? They did all kinds of things. They would use ordinary tools, like this knife, for example. Witches might plunge this into the wall um, in order to be able to milk their neighbours' cows. They would plunge the knife in and then milk it in order to draw the milk into their own home. Domestic implements were believed to be at the heart of the witch's arsenal. They could supposedly be transformed into tools of the occult by using the most shocking ingredients. The way that they would have made this simple broomstick into, into an implement that could fly would involve the grinding up of bones, of babies, of murdered children, um, and the reducing of this to this kind of goopy fat. And they would smear this onto the broomstick. Um, and because of it, you know, this was a demonic and unnatural activity, the killing of, of children and boiling of their bones, this magic would make the broomstick fly. Why do you think they chose the image of a broomstick? It's a household implement which is available to everybody. That seems to have been one of the reasons why these came up so often in the stories. It also is a complete inversion of what a housewife is supposed to be doing with a broomstick. Instead of cleaning the house with it, it's a means of corruption and pollution and wickedness generally, just as the baby's bones are about the anti-maternal. This is the world turned upside down, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yes, this is exactly all the things that a woman should not be doing. 
But Agnes wasn't thought to be performing black magic alone. Witches were believed to combine forces at diabolic meetings. These terrifying celebrations of the dark arts were known as witches' sabbaths. Using court records, Marion and Malcolm are going to show me what they were thought to involve. Malcolm, what would have people started doing once they got here? They would start to dance round the fire and they would be feasting and celebrating. It's like a kind of a... It's been described as like a perverted village fair. But what was it that scared people so much about all this? Well, of course, witches have come here to pay homage to their master, Satan, to plot their foul crimes against their neighbours. There really is the dark side of religion. They have come here to do something terrible, because it's like a big black mass, so it's actually a, you know, it's a heretical and atheistical meeting as well. So all those things that are precious to order in society are being attacked and undermined. Inversion, transforming everything good into its dark, demonic opposite, was believed to be at the heart of the Sabbath. Anything wholesome would be made foul. A healthy stew would become an evil concoction designed to harm rather than nourish. In plays like Macbeth, um, Shakespeare, for example, imagines people putting in bits of tiger and baboon's blood and so on. So hubble, bubble, toil and trouble really was part of what they thought witches did? Yes, absolutely, yes. Anything that was out of the ordinary, that, that was obscene or, or erotic or exotic, that would all go on at the Sabbath. Popular religious festivals and celebrations would also be inverted at the Sabbath, becoming a hellish travesty, with participants supposedly dancing backwards. It's back to back, it's hip to hip, it's inversion, it's disorder, all the kind of things that the early modern world was very suspicious of. This is everything that was decent and orderly and proper in society turned on its head and turned backwards. But the main target of mockery was Christianity itself. Its rituals were subverted, so the devil became the object of worship, and all manner of sacrilegious acts would take place. The climax of the Sabbath came when the witches once again pledged allegiance to their satanic master. They would kiss the devil's ass. This was the so-called <laughs> shameful kiss, the unclean kiss, the osculum infamae. In the case of Agnes Sampson, we have an account where the devil supposedly hangs his ass over the sides of the pulpit so the witches can, you know, to really get in there and, and, and really him show, snog. give him a good snog, yeah. What the devil's kiss, the unclean kiss does is it turns everything on its head, social norms, political norms and, and religious norms as well. Of course, this is the Black Mass. This is a, an absolute mockery of everything that's good and holy about the church. And through this really foul sexual act, all those things can come together. It's difficult to imagine quite how shocking all this would have been to people around here at the time, but it would have been about as bad as it could get. It mocked and attacked everything that they held dear, a bit like desecrating a grave or something. And even today, there's something about it that makes you feel quite uncomfortable, isn't there? Of course, none of this really happened. But this is what our Tudor and Stuart ancestors firmly believed was going on in secret. Women like Agnes were supposedly turning their backs on everything good and exchanging their faith and virtue for powers from hell. Witches were a threat to everything that 16th century Britain held dear. And it was the moral weakness of women which was at the heart of this fear these guardians of chastity and family values and faith could be tempted to the dark side. And that meant that your mother or your sister or your wife or even you could fall. And that was a terrifying prospect. But the question is, why did our ancestors believe that this nightmare scenario was real? I'm about to find out why our ancestors were convinced magic was fact rather than fiction, and how practicing the black arts 
became punishable by death. I'm trying to find out why our Tudor and Stuart ancestors were so terrified of witches that they executed hundreds of innocent people in their desperation to exterminate them. One of these was Agnes Sampson, a midwife convicted of trying to kill King James VI of Scotland with black magic. I've discovered what witches were feared to do, but now I want to know why everyone took this fantasy so seriously. Imagine I'm your average Tudor bloke, decent, hard-working chap, just trying to make an honest living on my small holding. I've got a couple of pigs in the shed, I've got a few sheep on the common, and I've got my chickens. But look at this. This one has definitely pegged it. I don't understand it. She was right as rain this morning. I even had one of her eggs for breakfast. And now, all of a sudden, boom, she's dead. And there isn't a mark on her. The foxes haven't had her. The gate's locked, no one's broken in. And I definitely fed her this morning, honest. For 16th century man, there was one obvious conclusion. Someone in this village is a bloody witch. Our Tudor ancestors' obsession with witchcraft grew out of a long-standing belief in all forms of magic, stretching back to Roman times and beyond. By the Middle Ages, magic was such a popular way to deal with everyday problems, it had become big business. In towns and villages across the country, so-called cunning folk were doing a roaring trade selling supernatural solutions for all manner of troubles. Professor Owen Davis is going to give me a taste of what they offered. Good morning. Good morning. Owen, how seriously did our medieval ancestors take magic? Hugely seriously. They're living in a chaotic, unpredictable world, a world full of spirits and fairies and witches. People are constantly trying to make sense of why things happen and why they've happened to them individually. So there really would have been a sort of one-stop shop where cunning folk like you could have solved all my problems? Absolutely. They would offer pretty much to do anything for you, apart from raising the dead, as long as you paid for it. All right. My sister's husband is a bit of a swine, and I think he's been having an affair with someone else. OK, well, I think we need to call their ardour. And mm. to do that, I need a lock and a key. Ah, a lock and a key. OK, now, if you give this to me, I'm using my magic, when I lock the lock, and I take the key out, I need to put them in water. Here are two buckets of water. That's what we need, so I'm going to put the key in one bucket and the lock in the other. And having done that, the two will never come together. Yeah. That'll teach them, won't it? This is a form of sympathetic magic, where objects represent people. Separating the phallic key from the tempting lock would also separate the errant brother-in-law from his mistress. You're transforming my life. But there is one big issue we haven't discussed yet, which is I don't think that my girlfriend fancies me anymore. Well, it looks like we need to get a magic spell together. And to do that, I need a rose. Ah, I've got a rose. Here's a rose. Perfect. Now, I also need you to give me that consecrated ink. And I will consult my book of magic to find a love charm for you. So I shall write the magic symbol on the charm. Yeah. And now I'll give that back to you. And if you strew the petals of the doorway of your beloved, she will love you forever. The spells of cunning folk were clearly about showmanship and suggestion rather than manipulating supernatural forces. Clients were encouraged to believe that everyday objects could have magical powers. But does this mean our ancestors were just gullible and naive? Not necessarily. Psychologist Claudia Hammond has gathered a group of rational, sceptical science students to demonstrate that many of us still subconsciously believe in the possibility of magic. So who is this? This is my mum and my little brother. And what's your relationship like with them? Um, well, my relationship with my mom has ups and downs, but she's been always there for me whenever I, I needed somebody to talk to. And your little brother? He's adorable. He always wants to talk to me on the phone when I call. I, he's just an adorable little bundle of joy. 
So what we're going to do is, I've got this board here, so I'm just going to put the picture mm -hmm. on this nice wooden chopping board here. Um, and I've got a knife. Would you be prepared to take the knife and, and stab the picture with it? No. But it's only a piece of paper, it's not the real people. It's so much connected to them, though. It's the image of them. I feel like they're looking out at me right now as I'm looking at the picture. I, I can't even bring myself to destroy an image of them. It's interesting that you wouldn't, because you know this, this isn't them. It's not going to hurt them. But many, many people would find this a very difficult thing to do. Uh, these are my grandparents. They, they looked after me a lot when I was young. Would you be prepared to stab the picture? No, I can't be comfortable with the idea of, of, of there being any harm to, to them in, in any way, however distant and how, however diluted it is even. But we could run you off 20 copies of that. And I completely acknowledge that, but no, I, I, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. That was such a simple experiment, but I found it absolutely riveting. It is extraordinary the different things that people do, and people find strategies to cope with it. People think that they might find it easy, and then you realise they don't want to do it. They're really uncomfortable with it. They know it's just a piece of paper. They know that's irrational, but they don't like it. In a sense, these pictures are a bit like voodoo. You know, there is this idea that, what if you found out afterwards some harm had come to them and you'd stab their picture? How awful would you feel? And I think that even though we know it's the 21st century, we can't slightly get away from that idea, this idea of sympathetic magic. So a picture is similar to a person. We know it's just a picture, but there's something about it that's deeply similar, and that's deeply disturbing for us. Even in the 21st century, it seems we can't quite bring ourselves to discount the possibility of magic. So it's hardly surprising our ancestors, who inhabited a world much less understood by science, we're prepared to believe not just in beneficial magic, but witchcraft and the black arts. And these beliefs were growing in strength and power as academics attempted to give them intellectual credibility. With the arrival of the printing press in the 15th century, their theories began to spread like wildfire. The fear of witches soon reached epidemic proportions. A lot of it starts with this one book, the Malleus Maleficarum, which means the Hammer of Witches. Um, it was written in Germany in the 1480s uh, by a chap called Heinrich Kramer. Um, and he had a collaborator, Jakob Sprenger, as well. So this is two Dominican inquisitors. These two guys were interested in catching witches, questioning them, indeed torturing them, um, and then in punishing them. So this is really a kind of handbook which starts that epidemic and then helps to spread it across Europe. But not many people could read, could they? No, they couldn't. But this is the kind of book that lots of gentlemen would have had in their private libraries. So the contents of this book would have spread very widely, even to people who couldn't read. What kind of things does it say? This is a book focused entirely on female witches. Men are being told um, that women can actually be having sex with the devil even while people are standing around them. The devil will be invisible um, and this could be happening to your wife while you're watching. Look at this. At the end of the act, a very black vapour of about the stature of a man rises up into the air from the witch. Yes. It's, it's so salacious that it makes us giggly. It's like something out of a tabloid newspaper, isn't it? It's erotic, but it touches on people's genuine fears as well. Yes, it does. Yes, this is exactly it. This is like a red top newspaper. Um, and you can imagine the same kind of motivations lying behind its publication. My goodness, people will buy this. But at the same time, we have really important knowledge to communicate to them about the devil and his ways in the world. When printed books like Malleus Maleficarum started to appear, witchcraft became taken increasingly seriously at all levels of society. The church wanted to show it was protecting people by hunting witches down and eradicating them. And it wasn't long before monarchs were anxious to show they were also playing their part. Dr Susan Duran has tracked down some revealing documents at Westminster Archives. Which monarch does this one relate to? This monarch is Henry VIII, 
And you can see here, it's the Act Against Conjurations and Witchcrafts, and it's 1542. And it's the first act that makes witchcraft a felony in England. What does it actually say? Well, it says here, where diverse and sundry persons unlawfully have devised and practised invocations and conjurations of spirits, pretending by such means to understand and yet know from their own lucre and, well, it goes on to say, to find treasure, to carry out maleficium, bad practices, harm to their neighbours, to people in the towns, and also, of course, treason against the king. And what would happen if they did those things? They would be hanged. At least if they were found guilty, they would be hanged. It's now very much the state's responsibility to safeguard the people who are under, living in the king's realm from the bad practices of witches. Did Henry believe this stuff? I mean, whatever we might think of him, he was a very cultured man, wasn't he? Yes, but it was ingrained in society, the belief in magic. Uh, he shared it with very many intellectuals, whether they were members of the church or whether they were secular. He definitely believed in magic. I'm going to have to be very careful with this document, I know, because it's just so precious. In Scotland, where Agnes Sampson lived, James VI, who was later to become James I of England, enforced several laws, one of which made both witchcraft and keeping company with witches punishable by death. James was pretty obsessed with witches, wasn't he? He came to be after he went to Denmark, where he had gone in order to marry his new queen, Queen Anne. When he came back, he became particularly engaged with the problem of witchcraft because a storm had almost shipwrecked him and his bride on their return to Scotland. James really became alarmed about this. He saw that there was a, a connection between his enemies, political enemies, and the powers of witchcraft. James was told that the storm had been magically raised by a witch who wanted to kill him. He was determined to find and destroy the evil being before she could do any more damage. But there was a problem. Although witches were fearsome supernatural creatures, they looked perfectly normal. So how could you spot one? I'm about to find out how our ancestors thought you could tell who'd been dancing with the devil. And I'll discover the best way to arrest and kill one of Satan's creatures without risking your own life. I'm finding out why our 16th and 17th century ancestors believed witches and black magic weren't fiction, but horrific fact. I've already seen how fear of these women and their supposed supernatural powers permeated all levels of society, up to the king himself. But now I want to discover how people actually dealt with these terrifying supernatural beings. How did they identify them and trap them and put them to death? After all, witches looked completely normal on the outside. So identifying who around you was in league with the devil required a very special set of tests. Professor Malcolm Gaskell is going to demonstrate a particularly brutal one. What people are trying to do is to get the evidence which they can use because they're going to have to go to a court of law. So one of the methods which is used is to subject the witch to the so-called ordeal by water. How did that work? Well, the idea is that you put the woman, the suspected woman, into the water and that if she's innocent, that she would sink and that if she's guilty, that she would float because the idea is that the, uh, this is a pure element of water and it would actually reject the witch. It's the reverse of the baptismal waters accepting the Christian child. In Catholic countries, a river or pond might even be blessed so it would become holy water. This would supposedly repel evil, forcing the witch up to the surface. 
Well, she would have been bound with her thumbs to her opposing toes, making the sign of the cross over her body, and uh, also bound so that she couldn't swim to save herself and so spoil the experiment. So all the people from the village who'd had suspicions against the suspect would have come out that day, all eyes focused on the individual in the water to see whether she was indeed a witch or not. People often do float, but there are accounts where people say, well, they floated even though we tried to hold them under the water with poles. There's nothing we could do to make this individual sink. And so that would have really emphasised the guilt uh, of, of the suspect. But if she did stay under, she'd just drown. Yeah, well, it's, people often think that actually you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you, you sink, then you drown and then you die anyway. Yeah, yeah. But actually, you know, these people would be attached to a rope because the idea is you haul them out. You don't want them to drown, because that could be murder. What you want to do is prove the guilt, haul her out of the water with the rope, and then use that testimony in a law court against her. But ordeal by water was just one way to detect a witch. Another was to find the devil's mark. When the devil touched his followers, it was thought his demonic heat would burn them, leaving a scar. This could sometimes take the form of a teat-like appendage used to suckle demons. I'm off to a dermatology clinic to see what sort of blemishes might once have been considered the devil's mark. This, again, is a very, very characteristic lesion that occurs with age. That is interesting, isn't it? And it's an unusual job for GP Jonty Heversedge. So any, anyone over the age of 40 will very often start to develop these lesions. They're called seborrheic keratosis or seborrheic warts. They look almost like a kind of scab on a, on a healing wound. But the other thing that it does look like is mm. a thumb mark. You can see why in medieval times people might have said, ah. you'd got the devil's mark. Ah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel about, about that? Don't worry me. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm past the soap by oh, day. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are concerned about moles on their skin, um, and you can imagine having something this size. It is worrying, but actually, from a medical perspective, um, this isn't of uh, any concern at all. Got um, a couple of wobbly skin tags. Tony, these are very, very characteristic of what we call skin tags. In mm. Incredibly common. They they tend to occur where the skin rubs. So the neck is commonly affected, the armpits are commonly affected, the groin is commonly affected. I suppose it's possible that these could have been what they call witch's teats, yeah. but on the other hand, they're so common, aren't they? Virtually every yeah. older person has got these. You're absolutely right, and I, I guess, you know, the first thing is we've just got to imagine that we'd be thinking about a much younger population, so they wouldn't have been quite as common as certainly we yeah. see them these days. Um, but the other thing is that very often they looked for these things in sort of secret places, in That's hidden right. places, um, and I do think that skin tags from that point of view kind of fit the bill. These days, they're concerned about for cosmetic reasons, um, but actually in those days, it would have had far more serious consequences. The discovery of a devil's mark was considered one of the most irrefutable pieces of evidence that a woman really was a witch. King James's investigators found just such a blemish on Agnes Sampson, and its discovery triggered a brutal, deadly sequence of events as the suspect was subjected to the due process of law. But how did this process work? How could you arrest and prosecute someone who could conjure up evil to harm you? How could the law of mere humans triumph over the power of the devil himself? Dr Jonathan Durrant is going to show me how our ancestors tried to tackle a supernatural being without endangering themselves. Right, we're a snatch squad about to arrest our witch. This is Louise, our researcher, who's kindly agreed to be our witch today. Uh, how do I take hold of her? You've got to be very careful about touching her. And you've got to be very careful about her sight and her voice, her words, because they're all demonic. She's been seduced by the devil and she's full of demonic power. So you need to keep her at arm's distance somehow. So you probably need some kind of stick. OK, I'll get, get the stick. Here we go. Yeah, just get her like that. Yeah, pin her up Trap against her. the wall. Yeah. No! No! Now you need to neutralise her power. 
How do I do that? The best thing to do there is to scratch her somehow, make her bleed. Now, where, where do I scratch her? I would scratch her across the forehead. The right away, across. <laughs> Bleeding was a common medical procedure in the 16th and 17th centuries. But with witches, captors hoped their supernatural powers would drain out of their bodies along with the blood. She'd be terrified by now, wouldn't she? She's not only being trapped, but the blood gushing all the way down her front. You'd be frightened as well, so you'll... I'd forgotten that, of course, I would have been as frightened as she was. That's right, you're frightened of her power. So what do we do next? You've got to manacle her. Guys, can we uh, manacle her up? No! No! OK, she's got the manacles on now. Right, now you've got to raise her feet off the ground. You need to find a plank to, to lay her on. Plank, guys! It was believed that if a witch could make contact with the ground, she could somehow channel the devil's power from hell. Do we know that this actually happened, or was it just propaganda? It's a su suggestion in a, a manual by some academic demonologists who, who did prosecute witches, and this is the way they suggest that you, you do this. I can imagine that people might want to do this if they feared the witch so much. There's, there's something cruel and brutal about it, which might be quite satisfying. <coughs> now what do we do with her? Uh, now you just lift her up and drag her through the streets uh, and take her to prison. Once a witch had been arrested, she was assumed to be guilty. But to secure a conviction, her prosecutors needed a confession. And they'd stop at nothing to get it. A fair trial was not the name of the game. I'm going to see for myself how barbaric torture could make any witch confess and the desperate measures prosecutors took to try and protect themselves from hell's fury. I'm on a quest to discover why our ancestors were so convinced witches existed, they executed thousands of innocent people trying to wipe them out. One of them was Agnes Sampson, a midwife believed to be the inspiration for the witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth. Agnes was accused of trying to kill King James VI of Scotland with black magic. I've discovered how suspected witches like Agnes were identified and arrested. But now I want to see how prosecutors obtained the confessions needed to convict and execute them. Contemporary accounts reveal a process that was terrifying for both suspect and interrogator. This has now become good versus evil, God versus the devil, and the um, interrogators therefore need to protect themselves against his power. What kind of things did they have? Well, there's the, the basic things like the, the cross, which gives you the protection of Christ. And you've got something in here. Feels like it's going to be a little, little doll or something. No, it's, um, it's salt. What was this for? Uh, the salt is, um, again, consecrated to protect the interrogators. Uh, we're not sure why that is, but certainly it's a, a positive thing. It flavours food, it preserves food, so it's a positive item. You've got strips of linen here. Yes, therefore, writing the stations of the cross on them that the uh, interrogator would then wear. I can see why you might want to wrap a prayer around you, but why the stations of the cross? It's a meditation on the arrest uh, and then execution of Christ himself. So it replicates what's going to happen in the interrogation room a bit later. The exact protective measures prosecutors took depended on the country and whether they were Catholic or Protestant. But once ready, all had the same job. To secure a confession. Although torture wasn't allowed in England, it was in Scotland and James VI oversaw its use in the interrogation of Agnes Sampson. The witch is now being brought into the interrogation chamber and she would have been brought in backwards, so you need to turn around. Why was she brought in backwards? So she couldn't see the prosecutor and, and whatever else is in the interrogation chamber and so she couldn't um, glance at the prosecutor and cause him some harm. But then when she turned around, this is what she'd see. What's this mask? 
This is a scold's bridle. It's very much like a witch's bridle, which would have been placed on the witch's head and it would have had prongs underneath her uh, chin uh, or, and perhaps in her mouth to make her feel very uncomfortable. But as Dr Lawrence Normand explains, the bridle was just the beginning for Agnes. That is a thumb screws, for example, and that's something that was used in the early stages of torture. It goes on the fingers like, like that. Yeah. And then, of course, it's, it's tightened and uh, the fingers are, are squeezed. And uh, for those who have tried it, they say it's acutely painful. I don't know if you're feeling any pain yet. That's really starting to hurt just there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and the, the purpose of this is to, because the, the, the witch's body is, is demonic, they, they can resist a lot of pain. So the, the, the application of torture is to kind of break through that. <laughs> to break through the resistance that the devil has given them and to get to the truth, to make them confess. But confession alone wasn't enough. Witches were believed to join forces to cast spells, and the prosecutors were after names. They wanted to know at the, uh, if there was a Sabbath, who else was there. They wanted the names of people. And as that happened, so the whole thing became snowballed and became more and more terrifying. If someone named you as a witch under torture, that was evidence enough to get you arrested. So the interrogation of a single suspect could lead to the prosecution of literally hundreds of people. And this is one of the reasons the witch trials of the 16th and 17th centuries became so big and so terrifying. So if you wanted more names from me, does that mean that you had to up the pain? There could be more pain, yes. There were worse uh, tortures than the, the thumb screws. What were these particularly used for? Well, these are a really nasty form of uh, torture, the pincers, which would tear and, and, and pierce the body. You'd be able to hear yourself burning, wouldn't you? And smell it too. But even after torture as extreme as this, it wasn't necessarily over for women like Agnes. The prosecutors didn't just want to eradicate witches, but witchcraft itself. To do this, they needed as many details as possible about how the dark arts actually worked. As long as they didn't kill the suspect, there was little they wouldn't do to get this information. This is the strapado, and it has several different uh, levels that it, you can go through. The first is a basic level. Um, her arms will be tied behind her um, at the back, and so it's pulling up on her shoulders and uh, possibly damaging her ligaments, her tendons, her nerves. It would be agonisingly painful, wouldn't it, to be held up with your arms up like that. Yes, that's not the worst of it. If that didn't work, they could just lift you up off the ground slightly, putting more pressure on your shoulders. If that didn't work, then you could put a weight on. Like uh, this? Yeah. OK, you'd lift her up slightly, and then uh, the weight would be pulling through her whole body. If this didn't work, you could uh, use a process called scorsation, where you just lift her up and then drop her Ooh. and catch her before she hits the ground. You'd definitely dislocate your shoulders then, wouldn't you? Yes, you might even break them at that point. And if that last one didn't work, then you could do repeated scorsation in something called the rabbit jumps, which is just doing scorsation several times. What I find so eerie about this is that she stopped being a human being for the guys who are applying this torture. The whole process culminated in the courtroom, where the confession of the alleged witch was read out. If it convinced the court, she was convicted. These confessions helped make ordinary people believe that the fantasy of witchcraft was very real. What happened to Agnes? Agnes was found guilty and she was executed the next day. She was taken through the streets of Edinburgh in a cart up to the Castle Hill where the Scottish witches were burned and she was put on the, on the, on the pyre and she was garroted and burned. As the sentence said, her body was burned to ashes. What was the point of burning somebody after they'd been strangled? Normally people are buried. Um, they're not cremated. And cremation 
basically eradicates your physical presence from the earth. So in effect, you've got no body there when the Day of Judgment comes, no body to rise up again and stand before God. What would the people who were watching it have felt? Well, those who were glad to see a witch being destroyed would feel that um, an evil element in the society had been, uh, had been deleted and that society was made purer as a, as a result. The last execution of a witch in Britain was in 1727. In 1735, the state officially recognised that witchcraft was fantasy and it ceased to be a criminal offence. By this time, more than 40,000 innocent people had been executed as witches across Europe. What's so horrifying? is how executing someone for an impossible crime like witchcraft should seem so sane and rational. This is partly because some of the finest minds in medieval Britain and Europe were determined to come up with theories to justify their beliefs, and they were good at their job. By the time the church authorities and the monarchs and the academics had finished, most of our ancestors were convinced this demonic fantasy was real. But their success is surely also because people like you and me, ordinary people, wanted to believe. When things go badly wrong, we look round for an explanation, someone to blame. And in medieval Europe, witches were the perfect and deadly target. Next week, gods. Who were the forgotten deities we Britons once worshipped? What terrifying things did they demand of their followers? It's a castration claim. And why were some only appeased with human blood? There's nothing else you can do. You have to turn to a human being as the ultimate gift. Ah!